Welcome everybody on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I am an educator at the museum. And this afternoon, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Martha Sternbach, a Holocaust survivor from Hungary, who will share her story with you. And afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to ask her questions. Before we begin, I'd like to share a quick history of our museum. Our museum was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that future generations would always remember and learn from this tragic history. They did this at a time in the early 1960s when uh, many survivors were not yet willing to relive their trauma, largely because most people were not yet ready to listen to their stories. But thanks to the courage and foresight of this group of survivors, we have what became the first and oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States, always with the mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. We can't do the work that we do today without our survivor community, who still on a regular basis shares their stories with groups, particularly students, our future generations, so that they can make sure that um, we always will learn and remember this part of our history. Today, it is truly my honor and privilege to welcome Martha Sternbach, who has been volunteering with us for um, several years now, sharing her story on such a regular basis to students. And we're so honored to have her with us today, sharing her story, and of course, to have Martha as a part of our community. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your story and for everything that you do for us. We're so happy to have you here and uh, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, and hello, everybody. So I was born in the name uh, Hungary in the country in 1926, November 17. I was born in a small town where my father was born. And my mom came from the city. It wasn't too far. Whenever I wanted to visit my grandma, I would ride my bicycle. It took about an hour with the bicycle. And you know, I had a sister two years older, Lillian, and I had a brother two years younger, Ernie. We didn't have a public school. We had a Protestant or a Catholic school. And when, when we lived close by, wherever I lived closer to school, but I remember the Catholic school better because at one time we lived across the street and I could go home for lunch. And you know, we know everybody in town and everybody knew my family because my father owned the store and everybody shopped in our store. We never had any problem, you know, it was such a peaceful time. You know, around 1940, we heard a lot of rumors, you know, when the Nazis invaded Poland and Czechoslovakia, so people escaped from those countries, they came to Hungary. They felt safe in Hungary. And you know, those days we didn't have television yet and with the paper, newspaper didn't print anything, only when people escaped from those countries. We've heard the rumors. One Friday night when my father came home from the synagogue, he was telling us that two young men escaped from Poland and they were saying that people had to dig their own grave. And around 1942, finally they had a new rule in Hungary. If a Jewish person wanted to buy a home or any other property, they could only buy it if nobody else wanted it. And my father wanted to enlarge the store and there was a house for sale on Main Street. So he went to the mayor's office and he asked the mayor if he could buy that home. And the mayor said, no problem. And he asked my father for a certain amount of money. And you know, in a small town, we had the store in the front and our living quarters in the back. And we moved into the home, but we didn't even live there for a year when we got this registered letter that we have to move out because somebody wanted that home. That was our first experience prejudiced against us. Of course, we were upset, but then my father said, you know, if things start to change, maybe we better off not to live on Main Street. So we rented the house and we moved out. 
And in 1943, my father was called into the army. You know, my father was a medic in World War I. My father was in America. He came to America in 1910. He went to medical school in New York. He had two older sisters married and an older brother married. And then they find out that my grandma was sick. My father went back to Hungary for a visit and he couldn't come back anymore because World War I broke out in 1914. That's where he was a medic. And you know, during the war, he was captured by the Russians. He used to tell us in Siberia, it was so cold that the soldiers that were wounded, they couldn't move around close to that. And then he was called into the army in 1943. He was in uniform, but after six months, they discharged him. He was considered too old. He was 52 that time because all the young Jewish men were taken in for slave labor. They were slaves to the Hungarian army, they did all kinds of work, building roads and all kinds of work. And, you know, in my hometown, it was still quiet. We didn't have any problem. And in 1944, April, there was a new law that all the Jewish people have to wear a yellow star. Whenever we go out, we have to wear a yellow star. I remember the first time I went out with the yellow star, I went to visit a friend. She fell and she had a cast on her legs. And while I was visiting her mother made a remark, she said, I don't know how we're gonna run with Amy with a cast on her legs. I couldn't understand why she said that. And I went home, I asked my parents and they told me they don't understand why she said something like that. And you know, we have our holiday in April called Passover, sometimes the same time as Easter. And we celebrate for eight days. The first two days, men go to the synagogue, we don't travel. But after every year, we would hire a carriage and go to visit my grandma. And all the other relatives would come, just like here you go on Thanksgiving, Christmas time. And they would talk about that planet. And I asked my parents if we're gonna go this year. They told me we're not going this year, but I wanted to go. I couldn't even understand myself. I was so determined. I told my parents, but I'm going to go with the bicycle. Not only my grandma lived in the city, but I had a cousin. She was married to a rabbi. He was already taken away for slave labor. She had four little children. The oldest little girl was eight years old. And I did go with the bicycle. And just before the city, there was a highway and I had to stop. The first time I saw the Nazis with motorcycles and Jeeps. And when the convoy passed by, I continued my way. And that was the last time I saw my grandma and my cousin with the children. And we finished our holidays, you know. I don't know if anybody knows, we don't need bread for eight days. This is from the Bible. When Moses took the, called the children of Israel from Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt. And they were trying to bake bread, but there was not enough time for the dough to rise. So they baked that probably look like a pita bread. So we commemorate that and we don't need bread for eight days. And after we finished the holiday, we got a messenger from the mayor's office that by nightfall, all the Jewish people have to be in our synagogue. We could each carry, but not too much. We had 16 Jewish family in town. And you know, when the young men were taken away to slave labor, my mom made sure that their wife and children have everything that they needed. And this time too, she said, I'm gonna go to Mrs. Fleet. She has all those young children. I wanna make sure those children have enough shoes and clothes. And I remember my sister and I said, but you know, mom, we have to get ready. So she said, you know, girls, what to bring comfortable shoes and clothes. And she went into the store. We didn't have those plastic shopping bags those days. Everybody had baskets. She took a basket and she filled it up with clothes and shoes for the children. So by nightfall, we were all in the synagogue. And you know, we didn't either have bread in the house. I don't think we ate anything that day. It was a very emotional day. But our neighbors were very kind and they were bringing milk and bread into the synagogue that night. And you know, when the war started in Europe, Everybody was saying the money is not going to work too much. So a lot of people bought gold. But because my father believed in this country, my father bought dollars. 
and he had the dollars and my mom, mom was wearing a gold watch and a ring and he took it away from her and he put it in one of those hanging chandeliers in the synagogue. And he told each of us, if any of you come back, you know where those valuable things are. So we spent the night in the synagogue and the next morning, Carrie just came to take us away. And there was a young clergyman in town. He was a very good friend of my parents. He came that morning and shook hands with each of us and wished us good luck. And now the carriage just took us to the train station and the train took us to the city where the ghetto was, you know, where the ghetto is. Just a couple of streets where all the Jewish people stayed. So five of my family members, we were put into this one bedroom apartment owned by the young couple and the young couple who had parents with a sister and another couple with a son. No, we really didn't have a bed to sleep in. We just slept on the floor on some blankets. The only thing we did, you know, we had a community kitchen. And like my mom is always there to help everybody. We used to go there and then we see young women with little children, we tried to help. Everybody, everyone helped one another. And then they were making the ghetto smaller. This time we slept in an attic on some straw. Well, it was difficult to sleep because it was very close to the train station and th the train was whistling all night. And after a couple of weeks, they told us we're going to leave the ghetto. Then they put us into cattle cars. I have no idea how many of us you could sit, couldn't sit down. We just stand next to each other and they gave us a bucket to use as a bathroom. And after a couple of hours, people just collapsed on one another. Children were crying and old people were complaining. They were very uncomfortable. And the train had to stop everyone once in a while to empty those buckets. I can't remember exactly how long the train was going and finally stopped and the door opened up. It was still very dark early in the morning. All we saw is this young man in striped uniform. They called them capos. And they were yelling at German, in German, everybody out press, schnell hero, schnell hero. And they were separating the men from the women but they were rushing us so we didn't even have a chance to say goodbye to my father and my brother. My sister and I was holding on to my mom and this couple asked my mom in German how old she was. You know, the second language was German in Hungary. My mom spoke very good German. My mom was only 42 and I have no idea until this day why she said 52 and as soon as she said that, he pushed her to the left and even before we were asking what's going on, he said, don't worry, you're gonna see her later. Now we were in Poland and the concentration camp called Auschwitz and they were rushing us to go in further, further. As it was getting lighter, we could make out those very high wire fences and behind that wooden barracks with brick chimneys. And they were rushing us to go in further, further, this area called Beer Canal. We came to a large building. There were two girls, they spoke a little Hungarian. The older one, her name was Miri. They called her the Blockerfeste. And the young girl, her name was Gerdi. She was about my age. We went into the building. They told us we had to take all our clothes off. There were hooks on the wall. Just hold on to our shoes and we had to stay in line. I remember looking ahead and I saw this couple. They were shaving over the girls' hair. I couldn't understand. I thought they were dirty. Well, they shaved all our hair off and whenever we had hair. And when everybody was done, then we went outside. And just before we went into the next building, front of the building, there was this very, very large cement container, this white liquid. I heard them yelling something I couldn't understand. So Gertie hit me with a strap and she pushed my hand down where I was holding my shoe. This was to disinfect your shoe in that white liquid. And then we went into the building. It was a shower room. There were shower heads on the ceiling. I tell you, up until then, we were together, families and friends. No matter how difficult things were, we never complained. We were brave. But I still remember, I still get emotional. When I remember when the cold water was coming down on my face, my tears were falling because I couldn't understand why this was happening. This was like the worst nightmare, but unfortunately it was real.
And when they stopped the water, they didn't have anything to wipe ourselves with. And when you looked at one another, you hardly recognized your own sister without the hair. And then we went into another room. There was a long table and the table had dresses on. He told us, put your shoes on and no wonder they'll just take a dress. But they were always rushing us. You couldn't see the dress fit you or you didn't fit you. We had just had to do it very fast. And when everybody was dressed up, then they took us into the area where I saw those barracks. They called this the sea lager. And the barracks were numbered. They put us into this barrack 18. We went inside where we saw this wooden bed, three layers, no cover or cushion. I'm still not exactly sure if it was 10 or 12, 12 girls on each layer. And from my hometown, there were two other girls my age, two girls 10 years younger, older, and two, my sister and I. And we were always trying to stay together because every morning early we had to go outside. They were counting us. They called that tail appell. First, we recounted us and the SS came to count us. And in the morning, they would give us a little black coffee with a piece of bread. At lunchtime, again, we had to go outside. At lunchtime, they gave us some kind of a soup in a round dish, no spoon. You just have to drink from it and pass it around. But the air had such a terrible odor. So in the beginning, we weren't that hungry. We just couldn't eat that soup. But I could tell you, Later on, we were so hungry that we couldn't worry about the smile or the taste. We just had to eat whatever they gave us. And at night again, we had to go outside. They counted us again. And if a girl didn't feel good, stayed in the barracks, we had to stay outside until everybody was fine and counted. And next door to us, we could see through the wire. They called them the chair lager. It gave us hope, you know, there were all that women and very young girls, they were dressed very nice. But their face looked so strange, you know, they looked like wax. And one night we heard a lot of crying and screaming. During the night, we were not allowed to go out from the barracks. And the next day, that whole area was empty. I don't know if you ever heard of Dr. Mengele. He was the doctor that came to select girls for work. And whenever they selected a girl, they put them into the cella again and they put number on their arms. You know, I was selected many times. Mengele would have a stick and hit your shoulder if you're selected. You know, my sister was as healthy as I was, but he was, she was always very thin. But you know, while we were in the sea lager, you could change places with one another. So many times I was selected, but I always changed places with another girl. We all wanted to stay with our sisters and with our friends. And you know, when we came to Auschwitz Birkenau, it was the beginning of June. And now it was already beginning of October, especially in the morning was very, very cold. But each time after we were got back to my sister, she would tell me if one day we cannot get back together, if it's possible for me to go with our friend from my hometown. And we were still together and they told us we're gonna leave the sea lager. We were hoping that when they take us, we're going to stay together. But again, we had to get undressed, and that's the way they were selecting girls. And you know, if those girls were thin when we got to us in Birken, or now they were even much thinner. And the girls that were not selected for work, they were too thin. There was a little boot with a curtain. They were pushing those girls in that little boot. And when I saw them pushing my sister, I ran to Miri. I said to Miri, you know, I want to be with my sister. Can I go with her or she could go with me? And she looked at me and she said, you know, you're not being fair. She's so thin. They're going to take her someplace. Then there is going to be more food. So she should gain weight. I wish I could explain to you this. I was so naive or just plain stupid that I believe me. And I'm going to tell you honestly, while we were in Auschwitz, Birkenau, I had no idea there was a gas chamber in the crematorium. But now many a times I'm thinking my sister must have known something because each time we had, we had selection, she was scared. Only after the war I find out. If I would have known, I don't think I would be here today. And as we were standing outside, you know, that this time they gave me a dress and a wooden shoes and even a coat. 
And I was staying outside with a group, group of girls. I mean, my friends from my hometown was in a different group. A lot of girls changed places with one another. I could have gone with them. I have no explanation. Only after the war, I find that only two survived from my hometown. And every time I see something, I would say, did you ever see something that you look at it and you don't believe what you're seeing? As it was staying outside, there was an open truck passing by with naked, bruised bodies. I looked at it and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then all of a sudden we saw a group of older ladies dressed up very nice and very young girls dressed up nice. And the sister recognized their aunt from Budapest. And they were calling her name and she was looking around very confused. And every time we saw women dressed up, I thought they lived there. After the war, we find out that was the last transport from Hungary, from Budapest. And when you say all there and very young, that meant they were taking them straight to the gas chamber. And then they gave us a little package of crackers and cheese, and they took us to a train station. We didn't go far, we got off from the train. There were three civilian men, they owned the factory. They looked us over and they okayed for us to go to work in the factory. So we went back on the train again. This time the train took us into Germany. I can't remember how long we were going. When the train stopped, they told us this town called Altenburg, and that's where the ammunition factory was. And every morning, this older German soldier, sometimes women in uniform, they would walk us to the factory because I was considered between the young one. In 1944, November the 17th, I became 18. So I didn't work on a heavy machine, just standing in front of the table. There was a wooden tray, and the tray contained this black, right, round metal pieces, and you had to examine it. If it was damaged, you had to take it out from the tray. And watching us work, if I'm going to say an old German lady, I guess when you're 18, even 50 seems old, I want to remember her because she was very, very kind to us. I remember at Christmas time, she bought us each a little apple. There was a very pretty young lady also watch us work. And she would always whisper to us that her brother is in the army and he wrote that the war is going to be over soon and we're going to be all right. You know, during the night, you could hear planes go by and all kind of noises. And now it was April 1945. They told us we're going to leave the factory. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. And we started out, we had a couple of older German soldiers and a couple of women in uniform. And the men had little white flag in their hand and the women put on this white kerchief on their head. We had no idea why. But on the road, it was a, such a chaos, you know, German people running from all sides. Some had carried a little bundle, some had a small suitcase, some were pulling a little carriage. We had no idea what was going on. I can't remember exactly how much, how long we were kept on going. Then finally they told us we're going to stop here. And they told us there is a lot of shooting going around <clears throat> and we don't want to hit by a bullet. So they showed us this hills to go up there. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we were laying up there, up there in the hills, I saw this young German soldier with a machine gun. First I thought maybe he came to kill us. Later we find out that liberators were coming and he was trying to run away and hide. Let me tell you, after I was separated from my sister, you know, it was very difficult. I became like a zombie, like a robot, just follow orders. And, you know, we were all from the same region in Hungary. Because I had an uncle, he was a, a rabbi and everybody knows, know my uncle. So everybody knew my sister and I that we are Rabbi Pollock's nieces, because Rabbi Pollock's wife was my mom's older sister. So as we were laying in those hills, next to me there were four sisters, older and I was another girl from their hometown. And you know, they probably felt sorry for me. I felt so sad. So by the time in the morning, they befriended me, you know, they were very, very nice. When we came down from the hills, it was, 1945, April the 13th, I think it was on a Saturday, 
He saw a jeep coming. It was a British soldier. He stopped. He was trying to find out who we were. Of course, we didn't speak English. We were so hungry and he had a lot of boxes in the jeep. First, it looked like he's going to open a box, but then he had no idea who we were, so he just got back in the Jeep and left. Now, six of us girls decided to go into town to find something to eat. As we were walking in town, there was a little hut, and the window opened up, and this lady asked us to come in. We went inside, and she looked at us, and she said, I know you must be hungry. I have some food for you. And she showed us the bathroom to wash up. You know, while we were in Auschwitz, dear Kennel, the Nazis used to call us lousy Jews. We were very clean when we were in Auschwitz, dear Kennel. But the end, unfortunately, we were full of lies. You know, we just had one dress. We could never wash it or take a shot. So we just washed our hands and she gave us something to eat. And she told us that her husband and her son is in the army. And then she said, you know, I have a room for you, my son's room. You're welcome to stay. Well, we really didn't have anywhere else to go. So, so we spent the night, and in the morning, we decided not to impose on her any longer. We just thanked her and we left. Let me tell you, I never forgot those ladies, especially this one. The way we looked, and she let her come into her room. You could really learn from that how important it is to be nice and helpful whenever you can help somebody. And God bless the American army. They came and they were wonderful. You know, there was an empty office building, office building, and they set up a kitchen there and they gave, gave us, to, bought us some cars to sleep on. But we were very anxious to go back to Hungary. But they told us the war is not over yet. We cannot go anywhere. And one day, two ladies came from the Red Cross and they were asking our ages. I mentioned they considered me between the young ones. We were about four or five girls. They took us away to a different area and they explained to us if any of us wanted to go to any of the Scandinavian countries, families would adopt us and we would have a very good life. Nobody wanted to go anywhere. I believe that my family must be back home. So we thanked them and we told them we don't want to go. We just want to go back to Hungary. And now it was End of May, they told us the war is over and we could start to go back to Hungary. But every time we went down to get a passenger train, the Russians were looting Germany. All you see this open wagons full of all kinds of things, toilets, sink, furniture, day and night. The first passenger train we got on, we didn't go too far. This place was very famous resort place called Karlsbad. There were a couple of ladies they took us up to a building like a hotel. And the first time we took a shower and we slept in a bed. They told us we could stay as long as we want. We only stayed one night and for anxious we were to go back to Hungary. Again, we waited for a passenger train. I can't remember how long it took. Finally, we arrived to Hungary. And on the station, there were a lot of young men. They were survivors of the Holocaust. I was talking to this young man. You know, my mom had an older sister that lived in Budapest. I had two cousins. One was my age, one was two years younger, and my, my uncle. And he said to me, you know, you'll end the whole family is back in their own apartment. He said, you could go to see them tomorrow. And they took us to a building. They gave us dinner at that time. And, you know, I know where my aunt lived. You know, in the summertime, my cousin spent the summer with us. And Christmas time, when we didn't have school, we would go to Budapest. It was a beautiful city, had an amusement park, a circus. Actually, I have to tell you, it's two cities, Buda and Pest, the famous chamber that connect the two cities. And my aunt lived in Pest, and it wasn't far where I was staying. So I got up very early the next morning, and I came to the apartment. I rang the bell, and my aunt Miriam opened the door, he looked, she looked at me and she said, you look familiar, but I have no idea who you are. She hardly recognized me. That's when I find out what happened to everybody because the Russians liberated Auschwitz in 1945 in January. And General Eisenhower find all those death camps with the army. So they already know everything what happened. 
And let me tell you, no matter how much I cried, it didn't change anything. And my aunt said, I have to go to register. They wanted to know how many people survived. I remember going to register and they gave me some money, but inflation was whatever you bought today, the next day cost twice as much. I came out from the building and I saw this young man, no leg, sitting on a board with wheels and had a cup in his hand. Many of these young men were wounded during the war, became beggars. Everywhere in the city, you then you see this young man with a cup in their hand. I don't know how much that money was. When I looked at him, I thought to myself, he needed that more than I did. So I just put that money in his cup. And I told my aunt and uncle, I really didn't want to stay in the country anymore. I know my cousins were telling me when the Russians liberated and occupied the country, the soldiers really didn't behave. So I told my aunt and uncle, I really want to leave the country. I don't want to stay any longer. My aunt said to me, I don't know where you're going to go and settle. Always remember the kind of a family you came from. Nobody ever talked about how rich somebody was, the kind of a family, you know. My mom was the youngest of eight children. My grandfather was a rabbi, but he must have died very young because even my mom didn't remember her father. But my mom had four brothers and they all became rabbis, you know, that's how people know you, the kind of a family you came from. And you know, my aunt Miriam came with me to my hometown and my neighbors were telling me that the mayor ran away and then a young man was liberated by the Russians. His name is Freddy Schwartz, he became the mayor. So we went to meet him and I told him about my mom's watch and ring and the money. He said, maybe somebody will find that he's gonna ask people. And he said, you know, there is a room, whatever he find in the homes, if I recognize something that belong to us. I remember going into the room and I recognized the two silver candle holders, you know, Jewish ladies light candles before sundown on Friday. And that was my mom's. So he gave me that and we went back to Budapest. And a couple of weeks later, Freddy Schwartz came to Budapest. He had my mom's watch. But you know, my uncle and then had to sell their, yeah, their valuables just to get money to buy food. So I gave the watch to my uncle to sell it. I needed clothes. I wanted to leave the country. There were organizations to arrange that, you know. When I came back to Hungary, I wore my cousin's clothes. And then I heard of this young children, they were saved in an orphanage between five and six years old. I went to meet them. There was a young woman with a little girl daughter you know those little children didn't even remember their parents and when they cried i gave them a hug so i told my aunt and uncle i want to leave the country with those children so there were organizations to arrange this and then we were ready we were already on the train hungary was considered the russian zone and just before the train went over to the american zone these russian soldiers came up on the train and they were checking what everybody was carrying. And then he looked at my knapsack. They saw the two silver candles. They took everything. But it's interesting. I really didn't care. You know, things were important before. My values, my, my priorities were changed. You know, I really didn't care about things anymore. What was important, the children needed me. And that was important. I wanted to be needed. So the first stop in the American zone was Vienna, but we didn't stay there too long. They took us into Germany to a DP camp. You know what a DP camp? Displaced persons, thousands of us young girls and young men, we lost our families and our homes. So there were a lot of these DP camps in Germany. The one we went called Leipheim. And I'm sure the American Red Cross, two other organizations that joined and the highest we had a humanity kitchen and we had housing and we were teaching just children how to write and read. And one day the children put on a little show. We were watching the children perform and in front of me a girl turned around. I mentioned those sisters that became friends with me. When we went back to Hungary, I stayed in Budapest and they went back to their home city. I didn't think I ever see them again. You know, when I, she turned around, her name was Hannah. 
seeing her, like finding your own sisters, you know, it was wonderful to see her. So she said to me, you know, we went to Budapest to look for you and you rent and uncle said, Marta is someplace in Germany, maybe you're gonna find her. So she, she told me the old that Bina got married to a young man, his wife and children got killed in Auschwitz. She stayed in Hungary. And she said, you know, my sister God is here. She also married a neighbor, a young man that his wife and children were killed in Auschwitz. They were there and Esther was the youngest. She was two years older than I was. She was single. And Hannah also married in Daipan in the concentration camp, in the DP camp, you know, to this young man, Ernie Friedman, you know. While I was still in Hungary, I remember my aunt Miriam talking to somebody and she said, Marta is getting married and I was just listening. I said to her, who am I supposed to marry? You know, that nice young man told me he wants to marry you. I told myself, unfortunately, I lost my whole family, but I still have my mind. When you're a young girl, you want to fall in love. You just don't want to get married because somebody wants to marry you. But in the in lifetime, you know, there was a lot of marriages, you know, then we came, it was 1946. It, it stayed there in 1948, you know. There was a long waiting. Everybody had relatives in America, but the long waiting is. By this time, Goldie had a little baby boy and Hannah had a little baby girl. And there was another couple who had a little baby boy, same age as Goldie's. But you know, that little boy didn't develop the right thing. He couldn't sit up or smile. And they already had their papers to come to this country but they were not allowed to bring the baby. They had to leave that baby in an institution in Germany, you know. That made me so sad. You know, we just wanted to get out of Europe, you know. We looked at the whole Europe like one big cemetery. And then we heard an announcement that we could go to Canada. So Esther and I signed up. We were on the ship, on the way to Canada. You know, you walk around, you meet a lot of people. One day I was walking around and a young man was walking around. He had on a suit and I had a, a suit from the same fabric. So he was standing next to me and he said to me, you know, we look like husband and wife. I said, no, we look like sister and brother. So he told me that his mother and his sister was killed in Auschwitz. And he said, you know, my father remarried. A couple of days later, I met his father and his stepmother. As I was talking to his stepmother, when she found out that I was from my name, she said to me, you know, I was in your home. My brother was a teacher in your town. Well, I didn't remember her or her brother, but I did remember her brother's name was from there and he had a very good voice. And after he left, everybody was saying from there became famous, he became a cantor. You know what a cantor is? They sing in the synagogue. That's how I remembered her brother. Now this young man kept on following me around. It was very uncomfortable. I didn't want to hurt his feeling. So I said to him, you know, I have relatives in New York and there is a young man waiting for me there. Actually, it was true, I didn't even know. So we arrived in Canada and I was staying with a family in the suburbs of Canada. The name was Feinberg. The address was Realmar Gardens. They had two little boys. So I had whatever I could during the day. And at night I would meet Esther and we would go to school to learn English. And, you know, I mentioned my uncle, the rabbi, you know, they came to this country, probably with the red ship, the last ship that left Europe, probably around 1938. They lived in New York in the East Side. So I wrote to them where I was in Canada and my uncle wrote to his family, please let me come to New York to be with family. Everybody told me, you're not going to like New York. Canada is so much nicer. Canada was very nice, you know, but I still was anxious to be with relatives. I can't remember exactly if I went to New York in 1949 or 1950. And I lived with my aunt, my father's older sister, Aunt Frida. She had two married daughters and a married son, and she had grandchildren. And, you know, all my cousins spoke Hungarian. Because when my aunt came to this country, you know, they didn't speak the language yet. So I had no problem communicating with my cousins. And then I also find the job not far. I didn't have to travel. 
this girl from Europe owned the shop. She made children's clothes. So during the day I worked and at night I went to school. And my employer said one day, you know, I have a niece, Ellie, and her husband, Maurice, they would like to meet you. So people visited either during the week, weekend or at night. They li didn't live too far. So one night in a, they went over to visit Ellie and Maurice. They also spoke Hungarian. And a young man came in. Maurice had a brother named Sydney, a single young man. So we spent a couple of hours. And just before we left, Sydney asked me for my telephone number. Well, I didn't have my own phone. So I told him, you know, your sister-in-law, Ellie, had my Aunt Frida's telephone number. But after we left, Aunt Frida said, you know, it wasn't really very nice the way you said that. So I told my aunt, you know, I have no idea what the rules here. I never dated and I was anxious to work hard and save up some money to get my own place. So I really didn't know the rules over here. Took a lot of conversation between my aunt Frida and her niece. A couple of days later, Sydney called me up and asked me out for a date. So I said to him, you know, I have school that night. So he said, well, what is more important? Well, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. So we did that for a while. You know, he was the youngest of five children. He had two older brothers and two older sisters. As a matter of fact, one of her sisters was married and had a little daughter, was taken to Auschwitz, you know, when the little daughter was killed and she even had number on her arms. You know, they were living in the same area. They were taken before Hungary. Hungary was the last country that the Nazis invaded and she had number on her arms too. But her husband survived and her, she survived. So whenever we, she talked about, he talked about the family, you know, it felt so familiar. So we did that for a while and he was telling me he wants to marry me. But I was so scared, you know, I said to him, you know, don't say anything to anybody. You know, let let get to know each other a little bit longer. You know, he didn't have a car. So whenever we had a date, we would meet downtown, we went to a movie or a theater. And because he had a, had to get up early in the morning to go to work, so I didn't want him to take me back home. And he took one subway, one area, and I took it to another one. So by the time I went back to my Aunt Frida's hall, everybody knew that I'm going to marry him. And then he called me up and he said to me, you know, it's very hot in New York in the summer. So her, his sister had two young children. And they go up to the mountains called the Catskill Mountains. And their husband would go for the weekend. He said to me, I have a friend, Ernie, he has a car. His wife and his little daughter is there. Sunday, he's going to take us up to the mountains. And he said, bring a pretty dress. Everybody dresses up for dinner. So Sunday came, Ernie took us up to the mountains. Everybody had a little bungalow. And at dinner time, everybody's order stopped going into the dining room. And I was ready. I was standing by the door outside of the bungalow and Sydney was sitting inside. And I said to him, you know, it's really not proper to stay alone singles. We better go. He said, we don't have to rush. But as soon as we opened the dining room door, everybody was yelling surprise. It was an engagement party for us. You know, I used to tease my husband. I used to tell him, you know, you really tricked me. I didn't want to embarrass in front of everybody. So I accepted. So Sydney and I got married in 1950, December the 3rd. And in 1951, September the 16th, I had a son, Harvey. And in 1945, I have to remember the date, <laughs> 1945, I think, 45. I had a daughter in July, I had a daughter, Karen. And 11 months later, I had a daughter, Linda. And you know, we lived in the Bronx. When I say we, we didn't live too far from the Yankee Stadium, somebody asked me if I was a Yankee fan. Well, I have no idea about baseball. You know, you really have to know. When I'm watching it, I can't understand why grown up man running around. If you don't understand, it's very confusing. So we lived in the Bronx. Bronx. We had a two bedroom apartment. And you know, the children would play outside, the ice, men, ice cream men would come. It was very safe, but I was always overprotective. You know, my son Harvey would say, mom, you don't have to be afraid. This is a free country. So when my children became school age, what you call a parochial school, my children went to yeshiva. 
And then ha Harvey was 12 years old. We needed a bigger place. So we bought a house called Teaneck, New Jersey, not too far from the George Washington Bridge. So Karen and Linda was telling me, you know, mom, we never had friends in the neighborhood. Can we go to public schools? The schools were very good in Teaneck. Karen and Linda went to public school, but Harvey stayed in Yeshiva. He graduated from Yeshiva University High School, and he went to college to NYU, and he wanted to go to medical school. He went to Rutgers, it was a state medical school. And when he wanted to do internship, he came to California. He did internship in UCLA. He became a psychiatrist and a pharmacologist. And then she met, he met this nice young lady, Laura, and they got married in 1980 in January. And Karen also went to a state college called Douglas, a girl's college, and she wanted to be an audiologist. So she had her master's degree in audiology from uh, Columbia University in New York. And met a nice young man from another town, David, and they also married in 1980 in October. And Linda, you know, she was a very good student. You know, she skipped one year high school. She never, never applied for college, but where we lived in Teaneck, there was a university called Fairleigh Dickinson University. So she enrolled in there and she met this nice young man, Stephen, and they fell in love. So Stephen and Linda got married in 1973. It was, they had just their anniversary in the, in the you know, holiday weekend, you know. And you know what happened a year later, on September the 20th, I had a granddaughter, you know. I saw this shirt in a souvenir shop. It said, if I would have known grandchildren are so much fun, I would have had them first. Grandchildren are I had a lot of fun. So my granddaughter, Tara, you know, she was a drama major in college, you know, and she did some overt shows. She started out singing, she has a very good voice. Then she came to California. She does cartoon voices, Pokemon, and then she has a one on Netflix, Rainbow High. She plays the voice of Ruby, the red-headed girl. You know, she's very talented. I'm very proud. And Karen also have two sons. Jordan, the older one, worked for CNN. He married. I have a grandson, Julian. And Alex, the youngest, you know, he got this job. He was very good on the computers. He worked for this, this uh, doctors, you know, and he also got married, you know, when he got married, he had a lady rabbi and a Catholic priest. I believe we all are related. I believe that we are all God's children. And I pray and hope one day everybody will accept that. You know, we could live in peace with everybody. That would be so wonderful. And I have another, you know, a little a great grandson, Max, he was just two years old. And you know, my daughter would tell the boys, one day you guys go me, gonna give me a granddaughter. Well, they had boys, but now in November and December, we expecting two little girls with God's help, you know, it's wonderful. And I'm very proud of them, you know, and I'm thanking, and I'm gonna tell everybody, every day I said, God bless America. It is all the problems we have, we are very lucky to be here. You know, there's no other place in the world. We come here from all around the world, you know, and just hurt me with somebody complains, you know. And thank God we got a wonderful president and a vice president. If you want to talk about a person, a good person, you call them a mensch, you know, that's the nicest compliment you could give a person. And that's how our president is. Thank God. You want me to continue or want to ready for some Thank questions? Thank so much for sharing with us today. Um, I know we have um, some questions from our audience. So those watching on Zoom can use the Q&A box and those watching on Facebook can use the comments section and we'll answer as many questions as possible. Um, before we... Before we did some questions, though, I wanted to quickly share with everybody some some photos. Uh, 
That's my father. That's the only picture I have of my father. And Frito had this picture when he went to medical school. My son looks like him and one of my grandsons, Alex, looks like my father. And that's my mom's, when she was a young girl, she had a friend that came to this country. And when she find out that I survived, she sent me this picture of my mom. Thank you. Um, one of our questions here is from a friend of Tara's, your granddaughter, um, who thanks you very much for speaking. And she says, as a mom, I'd love to know what the most important thing to pass down to our kids about your history is. Well, you know, parent has to be responsible. Teach them right from wrong and teach them to be kind and don't judge people according to their religion or their color of their skin. You know, it's very important. you so much. Um, and somebody would like to know if you have any photos of yourself when you were young, and I actually do have this one here. Can you please remind us which one you are? Um, this one in the, I have on my right. Yeah, this one. And that's my cousin. She lives in Brooklyn. She has 34 grandchildren and over 60 great grandchildren. You know, she was telling me this. One day they were together and the and the room was full and she said to her son, are they all mine? The son said, yes, mother, this is the way we're getting even with Hitler, to have children and love them and teach them right from wrong. That's very important. That's my aunt Miriam sitting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what do you, a tribute to your survival? Well, you know, I tell you, it's very hard to understand, but I believe there is a word, I don't know if Hebrew or Yiddish, it is Beshev, meant to happen, because my sister and my brother got away to school, and when my parents wanted to send me away, I told them, I don't want to go away, because my mom was like a good friend, and my father was very knowledgeable. And I was afraid if I go away and people are going to be mean to me, I'm going to be miserable. And I was the last one that saw my grandma and my cousin with the children. So when I call it, I put the puzzle together, it seems like it was destined that I should survive. You know, there is a saying I heard from a lot of people, firemen and, and policemen that the survivor's guilt, you know, I used to feel very guilty about that I survived and not my family. Can you please share with us some memories of your parents and your siblings before 1944? No, I, I made up uh, two poems. The one is, hallelujah, I'm alive. Hallelujah, I have survived. But dear God, I'm broken hearted and very, very sad because evil men murdered my whole family and my friends. But I believe that the soul is with you up in heaven. So please, dear God, take good care of them. And when the day will come, when my soul be together with all of them, then I will sing hallelujah again. And another one, I still remember, how can I ever forget? I had loving parents. I had a loving sister. I had a loving brother. I had a happy and safe home. I had relatives, I had friends, I had neighbors. And in the garden, those fragrant lilac bushes, those are precious memories. It seems sometimes that it was a dream, but when I look at those old pictures, I know it was real. The years go by so quickly, and I'll be 96 this year, so I'm thanking God for that my mind is still clear. Thank you so much for sharing. And you wrote, so you wrote the, do you, when did you write those? I didn't even write it down. I just made it up. One night I heard this young lady sing Hallelujah. I don't know the words for the song, but I didn't go to sleep until I made this up. Thank you. 
When did you move to California and what brought you here? You know, after I, I'm sorry, my husband had first dementia and then Alzheimer's and he passed away 2016. And after my children asked me what I wanted to do for my 90th birthday, I told them I wanted to go to Disneyland. You know, then that reactor in Russia brought up the Chernobyl, they brought some Russian children here and they asked them what did they like in America the best. They, to, he, they said, Disneyland, everybody's so happy there. I told my children, I want to see everybody happy. So my granddaughter Tara wrote to them and they were very nice. They gave us a private tour guide. They gave me a big button for my, with my birthday and a, a, a Mickey's hat. And we met Mickey, you know, it was very nice. You know, I, all I wanted to know from Mickey, I said, you know, when my son got married, I was here and I said, look at me, I'm an old lady. And how come you still look the same? If you see, I'm gonna show the picture. Yeah, I have that one, but I have it here. My grandchildren came and all of us came to, I don't know if you could see that. And I stayed here. California is amazing, you know. When you're young, you're so busy, you don't appreciate this really beautiful flowers and birds, you know. I have a bird feeder, this little hummingbird. It's just amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. When what sorts of hobbies did you start um, through? Have you done throughout your life? Well, you know, I do embroidery. You know, I do a little embroidery for my great grandchildren, and and then here, you know, I do for exercise and also paint. We have a young lady that teaches painting, and I do, and I love to read. So there are good books that you could read. Now they have children bring me the large print, you know, and I, I always that I inherited from my father. Sense of humor from my mom and love to read from my father. He was very knowledgeable about everything. Do you have a favorite Jewish song? The what? Do you have a favorite Jewish song? You know, it's interesting because I don't speak the language. The first time I, whatever I learned a little bit, I learned in the DP camp. You know, they used to tell me you're so religious and, and you don't speak Yiddish. We didn't have a school like in Poland, you know, they have school, yeshiva for girls. In Hungary, we didn't have. So I really didn't speak Yiddish. You know, my grandma spoke better German than Hungarian. If you were well to do, you had the Freulein to teach you German. That was, but it was a different, you know, when I was in Bayern, you know, there is a dialect, it's hard to understand, but, but they call the whole diet, it's like when you call the, the Queen's English, you know, it is a different, you know, the dialect is very different. At what point did you tell your children and your grandchildren about your experiences? You know, I never talked about it. In 1994, someone called me up from Yale University. They wanted to take testimonies from Holocaust survivors. And I made a tape, it's very detailed, a two-hour tape, very detailed. That's the first time that my children and my husband find out about it. And you know, after my husband saw the, watched the story, you know, when we saw, saw this advertisement that there is a tour, an Israeli cashier to go to Auschwitz. My husband and I went with the tour to Auschwitz. Yeah, that was important for me. You know, Jewish people, when somebody dies, you know what they do? They cut their clothes and they sit for eight days, take their shoes off and people come to pay their respect. We never did that. But while we were at the crematorium, you know, they banned the crematorium, the Nazis. And we had a rabbi with us and I asked the rabbi if I could do that. So somebody cut my dress and I took my shoes off and for a half an hour, I was sitting there. That was very important for me. Thank you. When you lived in um, the United States, did you know a lot of other Holocaust survivors? Yes. 
all of them that I, those sisters, you know, they all are unfortunately passed away. But Esther's daughter, I'm still in touch with her, Sherry. She looked just like her mother. Very important, you know. We were like, we called each other lager sisters, you know. It's very important. Like Elvira said, we had our own language that's very hard for anybody that didn't experience that we did to understand. I'm going to share one more photo. Oh, okay. I was 24 and he was 29. Was really lucky to have a husband like that. He lived for 66, 66 years, a lifetime, you know. And he passed away next to me in bed. And is that him in the picture behind you? Oh, I have a lot of pictures. That, that, you know, that's him on um, the big one with the red background. That's you and your husband? Yes, that was my, my daughter Karen's wedding. That picture was taken. Thank you so much for sharing your story, not just today, but every time that you do this, which you do on such a regular basis, specifically for our future generations to make sure that they can always remember and learn from this part of our history. Since you speak so regularly to students, what message do you like to leave them with or anybody after listening to your story? I really, really first you say, God bless America, because you don't know how lucky you are. And you could accomplish anything you want. Don't let anybody bully you. You know, that's very important. And no right from wrong. Don't hurt anybody's feeling, you know. My husband used to be surprised at me. Somebody made a nasty remark about me. I never, it couldn't feel me, make me feel better to hurt them back, you know. It's, it's silly, you know, that's like childish, you know. You see, growing up people do that. It's very foolish. Well, again, thank you so much, not just on behalf of our museum, but on behalf of our community. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, so because you share this story and this message on such a regular basis. And so you've helped educate um, so many people firsthand about the Holocaust and your experiences. And we are so grateful to have you as a part of our community. And thank you so much to our audience for listening. And we hope to see you next Thursday as well. As a reminder, we have these talks um, on Zoom every Thursday at 11 o'clock. Um, and they're live streamed to our Facebook page. And uh, you can also access them later. But um, please um, continue to tune in. We appreciate it. And Martha, again, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today and for everything thank you, you Michael. Did for Well, us. without you, we wouldn't be able to do it. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. And thank everybody and enjoy the day. And always Sorry. remember to say God bless America. That's very important. Thank you. Well, it's an honor for me to um, host you. And I know for everyone to listen to you and everyone is typing in. Thank you so much. We hope also to welcome everybody at the museum. You can follow our website, holocaustmuseumla.org, um, to learn how you can how you can come to the museum. And we do have a new exhibit opening um, this Sunday, 9-11 Sculptures, Vignettes of Emotions. So um, we hope to see you then. But thank you so much, everybody. And Martha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Have a good day. Thank you. You too.